Hey YouTube, this is Freedom Voice. I want to do another video here. This is going to be sort of like a reaction to a really important uh, CBS special, special report that came out here. I want to go ahead and roll the video now and then I'm going to comment on it. At this very moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counterterrorism surveillance system like never before. Who is in charge of making sure that critical information doesn't fall through the cracks? Including a secret database to track suspected terrorists. You have no meaningful process to clear your name in something you have never done and will never do. It was meant to keep Americans safe. It's never really as simple as someone thinks it might be. The fact that we haven't had a major attack within the United States of the scale of 9-11 is not an accident. But over 20 years, it's evolved into something far bigger. This is a misuse of the power. This is a violation of the Constitution. There's a door, like a prisoner. This is a slow form of torture. All right, a couple of things I want to bring out. Uh, this CBS report uh, just recently came out and they are trying to raise awareness regarding the watch list. And I did several videos, uh, I think it was last year, on the watch list uh, showing what the ACLU came up with in their documentation of the watch list. Basically, there are three phases to the watch list. And the phases are based on the handling codes. And I do believe they've added a fourth phase. But there are three phases, and they're based on the, the way the police handle it using their handling codes. Now, I want to just kind of go ahead and put up the handling codes on the screen here. I covered this again, like I said, last year. But if you'll notice here, I'm circling handling codes. Uh, it says, as of 2009, KST util utilizes Three separate handling codes described detailed below. Handling code one for subjects with arrest warrants. Handling code two for subjects who are slated to receive DHS uh, detainers. And then handling code three for all the rest. Well, what they're showing in this video, what they're going to show in this video has to do with uh, handling code one and handling code two. Uh, this is where... Uh, individuals kind of receive a DHS detainer, Department of Homeland Security detainer, and they can't travel. But what TIs or targeted individuals or listed individuals have been uh, sort of talking about, complaining about, and trying to raise awareness for many years now has to do with handling code number three. Uh, this is the non-investigative subject. So I'm going to go ahead and run the video here and I just kind of show you a little bit more uh, what their the CBS special report is bringing out. Again, this is based on handling codes one and two. Turkish-born Halil Demir married his American wife Donna 35 years ago. This is going to be good. They moved to the U.S. in the 90s, and he became a naturalized citizen. Everything's ready. I hope you like it. Voila. So this please, is amazing. please, please, please yeah. enjoy. Thank Come on. you. It's so amazing how food transports us back to where we come from. True. In a way, this has also become American. True. Because you're American. True. I feel that I represent American people. <laughs> Two decades ago, Halil Demir founded the Zakat Foundation of America providing humanitarian relief around the world, frequently alongside the U.S. government and United Nations. Through his charity work, Demir has been invited to the Vatican, TSA headquarters, and befriended countless dignitaries, a calling that all started in the summer of 2001. Darkness comes only when there is no voice and there is no light. Thousands of lives were suddenly ended by evil, despicable acts of terror. At this very moment, 
terrorists could be plotting another attack. But who is in charge of making sure that critical information doesn't fall through the cracks? Surely, after September 11th of 2001, we could come up with one consistent terrorist watch list. In the wake of the September 11th attacks, the U.S. vowed never again. One of the best ways to do that? Creating one master list of suspected terrorists. And this man became a key architect of that list. The fact that we, bringing, we are bringing all these databases together is, is almost a blinding flash of the obvious, frankly. All right, here's where I wanted to jump in and just kind of uh, sort of clarify something just for those that are interested. Uh, he's talking about several databases. I've covered this before. Uh, there are quite a few da databases that the FBOYS use and also uh, NCIC. And these databases are based on suspected, known or suspected terrorists. Uh, the known or suspected terrorists are handled based on three handling codes, as I mentioned earlier. So keep in mind that they're referring to, and that's the reason why they started out the video with a foreign nationalist uh, from Turkestan or Turkey. Uh, I want to continue the video here. 20 years later, Russ Travers sat down with CBS Reports for exclusive insight into this secretive system. The government knew pretty fast that we had a significant problem because two of the 9-11 hijackers were known to parts of the government as early as late 1998, early 1999, and eventually they got onto airplanes. Help us understand, what is a terrorist watch list? We want to ensure that we're encountering people at the earliest possible time, if they may be a terrorist. And so it doesn't mean they're a terrorist, doesn't mean they're inadmissible, but it means there's something that has led a department or agency to say, this person needs a closer look. All right, here's where I really take issue with what he just said. I mean, you know, you can't really just be watching people just because you think they're look, they look suspicious. And you certainly can't uh, put someone on a list, a government list, and surveil them 24 seven, just because you think they look suspicious. I mean, for all intents and purposes, I think these guys should be watched as well. Does that give me the right to start snooping around their house, watching them as well as their, as well as their family? Uh, it's not constitutional. Every moment of every day, the American government's terrorist watch list is in motion. It works like an alarm system, scanning for unknown threats around the world. And we were getting upwards of 10,000 pieces of information a day wow. with 16,000 names a day. By the time I left the National Counterterrorism Center, we had something over a quarter of a million threats that had come into the center since 9-11. Most of them were completely bogus, but all it takes is one. 10,000 pieces of intelligence every single day or more. I mean, this is huge. Yeah. There was no way we could buy enough analysts, and so it had to be a combination of young analytic talent and technology. And that's been part of the constant evolution of this enterprise. Enterprise. That's what this is. A lot more than just a list. The terrorist screening data set is part of an entire galaxy of secret systems and programs. CBS reports reviewed a trove of government documents and court records from the last 20 years to piece together how expansive it is. Terrorist watch listing is run by people from half a dozen government departments with the highest classified clearance. They share lists of suspects with more than 60 foreign governments, 18,000 American federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies, and countless companies from private security contractors to airline workers. All right, a couple of things I want to point out here. Notice he keep, keeps using the word secret or the phrase secret list. Uh, it's been used about four times now. Anytime the government has to keep something secret, it's not so much because it's a national security threat. It's usually because uh, there's some violation of the Constitution or some violation of rights that's going on. Secondly, uh, if you'll notice, all of the private contractors that he mentioned all have security clearances. That suggests that everything they're doing is secret because they want to hide it under the auspices of a national security threat. The problem is, is most people on the watch list that are governed under handling code three are U.S. citizens. They're not overseas foreign nationalists. 
the watch listing screening vetting enterprise is as close to sort of the ideal information sharing environment, I think, that exists within our government. When it launched, there were 120,000 known or suspected terrorists on the list. Today, CBS has confirmed the watch list now has approximately 2 million people, including thousands of Americans. If you were to put everyone on the watch list in one place, it would be the fifth largest city in the United States. All right, I just want to show you that the numbers that they just referred to don't really reflect the numbers that have come up recently. And this annual statistic transparency report put out by the Office of National Intelligence uh, on this page here, it shows uh, the number of person queries, U.S. person queries for 2019, 2020, and 2021, 2022. If you'll notice, even though this refers to the duplicate counting of queries, uh, if you'll notice in 2019, 2020, there were 1.3 million queries. Uh, and again, I realize that this represents also duplicates, but you can see that they're actually watching more than the numbers that they mentioned here. They said several, several hundred thousand. It's pretty obvious to me from this uh, chart here that they're watching more. Let's continue with the video. You need me to help you with something? The Demir family thinks they're on that list, but say they shouldn't be and want the chance to prove it. I was a very young child doing the civil rights movement. I was actually the group of first black kids bust into all white schools. It wasn't something that everybody wanted, but it gave me the muscle that I need to, to go anywhere and just walk right in and I'm fine. In 2016, your family's life started to change. Yeah. What started happening? Well, um... We were invited by the State Department to uh, Turkey because high profile guests were there and we should welcome them. And when I was returning back, I was um, stopped and was uh, a lot of questions asked, contrary to previous times. Each time I got a plane, eight people waiting for me to go through everything. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. And that is eight years. Eight years is a very long time. If you didn't find anything, then I wish that somebody will say, you know what? doesn't seem to me these guys doing anything wrong. It started out that it's just a random check. Everybody gets random checks. But then after a while, they, they happen so often, it's like, how could, how could it always be random if it's always us? They're always waiting for us at the gate. They're like, oh, we need you to come with us. You know, we were in the back room together. And it was, you know, she's okay. She's a good kid. They just asked her like where she went, who did she see, you know. I'm convinced that one of these days, like, you know, we'll, our house will be raided or like Baba just won't come back from the flight. Guantanamo Bay is literally my biggest fear. Your daughter has said that this has- Oh, what? I think what most people don't understand is just how far reaching and devastating the consequences of watch listing can be. Hina Shamsi is part of a community of civil liberty groups fighting to get innocent people removed from the watch list and push officials to be more transparent about how they work. Here's what we do know. When you buy a plane ticket, put money in the bank, scan your biometrics, or go to the Super Bowl, you're being checked against the watch list. The results can stop you from flying home, passing a background check to get a job, even test drive a car. It can get your phones and computers searched, justify spying, or even trigger law enforcement to hold you at gunpoint. I've had clients who've been unable to attend parents' funerals, be by the sick beds of their loved ones, graduations. Um, I've had clients whose marriages have fallen apart. The watch list can also get you detained and interrogated by foreign governments, something that happened to Halil and Donna Demir when they traveled to Cyprus in September of 2023. They separated me from him and they put me in this room. There's the door. Like a prisoner. It feels like you're being treated like criminals. <laughs> that you've never had a day in court? No. We can't say innocent until proven guilty because that, that, that's not applicable here.
I'm hoping someone will say, how long has this been going on? I mean, people are terrorized. These are uh, lovely SSSS. SSS, 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 SSS. SSS, printed on boarding pass after boarding pass, every time Demir flies. The U.S. government calls it selectee status. For many, it means a few extra steps at the airport. But for Demir, it's a telltale sign that he could be a suspect in a national security database. I don't think anybody's ever said to you directly that you are on a list, have they? No, and you don't know why. The government takes the position that it doesn't actually have to confirm or deny that you are, in fact, on the watch list. What this boils down to is that you have no meaningful process to clear your name of government suspicion in something you have never done and will never do. Can you define what that something is that could get you flagged and put on a list like this? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so what what is a terrorist? And and back then, if you had blood on your hands, that was pretty easy. Uh, if you went to a terrorist training camp, probably pretty easy. What if you went to that terrorist training camp and got disillusioned and went home? Um, what if you gave money to a non-government organization that supported terrorist causes? The standard goes up and down. This is art, not science, to be sure. It also sounds inherently biased towards people from a specific background or a specific religious minority that by sheer default of being part of a specific community, will ensnare them in something they have nothing to do with. Religion has nothing to do with um, going on a watch list. However, uh, it's, it is a statement of fact that Al-Qaeda and ISIS were the two principal threats. And so the, the fact that there are uh, Arabic names is not going to be a surprise. And um, names that are similar to those are, in fact, going to, uh, they may well be caught in the system. All right, you can see how there's a lot of foreign nationalists who are playing roles on this video, and they're kind of spinning the narrative to kind of make it seem like this is a problem with only foreign nationalists. It has nothing to do with uh, U.S. U.S. citizens. But I've I've covered this before in other videos. Um, the majority of the individuals on the KST, uh, the known or suspected terrorists uh, list are U.S. citizens. That is the reason for the Section Section 702 hearings. That is the reason why this whole issue of watch listing is coming up. And they're making this video here, in my opinion, to kind of try to spin the narrative away from the reality of the real issue. The reality is not because somebody's name is close to Al-Qaeda or uh, a foreign terrorist group. The real issue is Government agencies, private contractors, people with security clearance are all coming together because it's kind of like a, a slurry of, uh, of, of, of opportunities for them to watch U.S. citizens and get paid. There's a lot of money involved with this because there, there's obviously a, a budget for, from Homeland Security to be able to surveil all these people. If you've got 2 million people, let's just say the number is 2 million. You've got to have personnel in place to be able to surveil them, whether it's boots on the ground in the streets or whether it's uh, individuals at an airport. Fact of the matter is the majority of the people on the watch list are people in the community, people who are being watched by uh, other citizens, we call them gang stalkers or community stalkers, and they're being paid to do so. The list is run by a complicated rule book that outlines who can and should be treated like a suspect. Teams of federal employees audit the process, whose only job is to safeguard civil rights and civil liberties. But advocates don't fully trust the system because most of this happens in secret. The government needs reasonable suspicion to put a person in their terrorist database but they also have exceptions to that standard. It's secret too. The standard for placement on the watch list is a scandal. Vague, overbroad, meaningless, 
verified corroborated facts are explicitly not required. What you essentially have is unfettered discretion. It's a very low bar. What's suspicious to one person is definitely not suspicious to another. Inside the FBI, Jeff Danik discovered an innocent man was wrongfully blocked from coming to the U.S. When I looked into it, I realized his name is showing up as one of about at least 50 aliases of a terrorist half a world away who's dead. He's dead. The agents would not take him off the list, so I gave up. And I've always regretted that. People don't want to take uh, responsibility for actually removing people from the list because what if something happens and then it will have been me that had taken this person off the list. It has happened. The Boston bomber, the Paris attacker, the Pulse nightclub shooter, all of them were known to US intelligence agencies but removed from the watch list before their attacks. Your average American, your average taxpayer is going to look at it and say, OK, has it been worth it? Absolutely. I mean, without any question. The fact that we haven't had a major attack within the United States of the scale of 9-11 is not an accident. It is a it is a function of keeping bad guys out, taking action overseas, working with our partners. But it's also deeply flawed. There's no question that we've had problems in the past. We've had cases where individuals were threatened with being placed on the no-fly list if they didn't serve as informants. Well, that's clearly wrong, and people need to be held to account. Over the past two decades, the watch list has been criticized for reportedly targeting tens of thousands of people that it shouldn't, often because their names were too similar to someone else who was under investigation. But one inspector general audit in 2008 found the information that put people on the list was often incomplete or flat out wrong. We are doing our best. If there's an alternative, I'm all ears. Uh, I don't know what it is. I mean, we, we, at the end of the day, terrorists don't wear a scarlet T across their chest. And we're having to make um, a decision about whether to let somebody in the country how else, other than a list, do you do that? All right, again, I want to jump in here and just kind of uh, show a document that I covered last year. And I do this because they really make it sound like this list that they're compiling are largely foreign nationalists. I want to show you from this document from the ACLU uh, what exactly, there are two lists, actually. It says, number one, the source agency submits names to either the F-Boys, domestic terrorism, or the NCTC, international terrorism. Now, the NCTC is what's being covered in this video, but there's another domestic terrorism list that are uh, sort of non-investigative subjects. They're mostly non-investigative subjects. And number, number two, it says the F-Boys or the NCTC reviews the nominations. The F-Boys or the NCTC submits approved names to the TSC for inclusion in the TSDB. The TSDB is the, uh, uh, the database that covers all the names. Uh, this is actually names of both domestic and foreign threats. The TSC exports the TSDB entries to downstream databases. Notice databases is plural there. There's more than one database, including the KST, all right? The F-Boys field office submits domestic and international nominations to the T-Rex. T-Rex, technical information specialists, review the nominations. T-Rex sends uh, domestic nominations to the TSC and international nominations to the NCTC. So you can see that there are domestic nominations that go to the TSC. And then there's international nominations that go to the NCTC. And the NCTC is only at 0.5% of the entire database. The other 98% is going to the TSC, which includes domestic names, domestic names of individuals who would be submitted to this one database. It's an overarching large database called the KST or the known or suspected terrorists. Tonight, the first 800 migrants from the Central American caravan are at America's doorstep in Tijuana, Mexico. It was 2018. 
As a so-called migrant caravan approached the U.S. border, reports started to surface that agents from the Homeland Security Department were keeping tabs on American immigration advocates, Terrifying. including this New York City pastor, Kaji Dosha. It was a nightmare. Around Christmas time, Pastor Dosha was volunteering on the Mexican side of the U.S. border, providing medical supplies and praying with migrants. In a secret intelligence dossier, officials wrote that the pastor might have a, quote, possible connection to Antifa. And they told Mexican law enforcement it was highly likely that she was in their country illegally. A federal judge found that none of it was true. Wrap your head around that for the idea of my government to tell the federales who are notorious to apprehend me. I'm not a particularly fearful person, but that was terrifying. Then the government put her and dozens of others on a new national security watch list. Critics called it a cautionary example of how a database of suspects could be abused or to target people because of politics or prejudice. These were people who were really good at their jobs. Just to be clear about who was there. It was lawyers, it was journalists, and then me, the pastor on the list. You believe you were put on a watch list by the government to intimidate you from helping migrants at the border? Yes, they've already admitted it. I, that's not I believe, it's, it's in the evidence. This didn't have anything to do with national security. The list was intended to keep us from doing that work. In March of 2023, a federal judge agreed and ordered the government to remove their security warnings against Pastor Dosha. Does the system work? No. I never saw any contrition for the illegal activity that the government did from any of the agents who did it. And I'm not sure that they even got a slap on the wrist. U.S. Customs and Border Protection told CBS that it has since revised its policies and referred misconduct cases for appropriate personnel action, but said it could not comment on specifics, including whether any action was taken. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. People might think that the watchlisting system is a remnant of 9-11. It is not. It very much continues to today, has expanded to other areas. The U.S. government has quietly created yet another watch list, according to an extensive documents review and conversations with more than a dozen intelligence community leaders. This one has nothing to do with terrorism, but works just the same. Against 40,000 people, it was created to target cartel bosses like El Chapo, but instead, it's now mostly made up of foreign nationals who are known or only suspected of having ties to American gangs. Half of them were added to the new database in a single year. This is a system that has only expanded. It has not been reined in, it has not shrunk, and it continues to ensnare ever more people. All right, you can see how this list is getting out of hand. I mean, we go from uh, people who are foreign nationals coming in from other countries to America, uh, basically getting citizenship, but their name seems to be very close to Al-Qaeda, a name of an Al-Qaeda member, to uh, Pastor Dosha, who is an American pastor, and she goes over to the Mexico border doing doing work for ministry work, and she's sort of being targeted for reasons that she doesn't know why. And then moving into domestic gang members like Hell's Angels and many others. But targeted individuals have been saying for many, many years that we were placed on the list simply because someone wanted to retaliate against us, simply because there seems to be a money trail for every individual that's placed on the list. I would say that the numbers are far more than 2 million people. I would say it's upwards to 5 million. And most of them, 98% of them, as the ACLU brought out, are U.S. Uh, citizens, people with uh, U.S. status. Monty Hawkins has served on the National Security Council for every administration since 9-11. Now he helps oversee watchlist policy for President Biden. This is his first TV interview. 
When we look at the number of people on the list, why is it expanded from 120,000 in 2003 when it first started to today where we have around 2 million people on it? Yeah. We became better at our job essentially of finding the information. It's not something really a list that we ever um, deleted from very quickly. President Biden, when he was candidate Biden, campaigned on this issue to address some of the very legitimate concerns of American citizens who have about these lists. Yes. Why three quarters of the way through of this administration has so little been done? So things have been done. To be fair to the community, a lot of resources were pulled um, with uh, the Afghanistan withdrawal. And so there was a bit of a, a delay, but they are back at it. The FBI told CBS that it recently raised the standard for how much identifying information it takes to include a person in its watch list. Still, it's been proven consistently that names-based listing is deeply flawed. Correct. Doesn't really work very well. And yet it's still a pretty much a names-based system. It is. I think the community realizes that. And so that's why there is a significant push to do more on the biometric side, um, primarily faces and fingerprints. The FBI told CBS that it credits the watch list with helping disrupt multiple terrorist activities over recent years but said it couldn't identify which ones without compromising its investigative techniques. There is an effort going on now within the White House to become more transparent with the public. What would you say to the two million people, roughly, who are on these lists, who may not feel like it's fair or right that they are? I would say a vast majority of those two million are not U.S. persons, not U.S. citizens. Those two million people who um, are on the list or on there for a reason. There's still people who are saying, hang on a second, why am I being scrutinized like this? I'm an American citizen. We hear it and you know, it's not something we, that it's done intentionally by any means. And so I think we are looking at better ways to make the system work. Is it almost seen as collateral damage that some people may feel scrutiny in ways that does violate their rights? You know, I would, uh, I would hope not. We want to have freedoms and civil liberties, and so it can't be this, this great eye in the sky, and it's never really as simple as someone thinks it might be. At least I personally want to know why is that happening and figure out, like, is that appropriate or not? Hopefully, this little, little support of ours will bring a little bit uh, comfort to the families. Enough is enough. We have 20 years, some of these people being on this watch list. This has to end. This is a misuse of the power. Would you take the government to court? Yes, I will. I'm going to ask transparency. I'm going to ask accountability. I'm going to ask justify why. You're going to fight. Yes, sir. We live every single day values of Americans. And to keep these values, I'm going to do whatever it takes. All right. Again, I, I'm going to jump in. This is the last time here. And I just want to... Uh, Mr. Demir here that's uh, filing for redress, he, he filed five times. He filed five times between 2016 and 2022. And I think for targeted individuals, I think it's, uh, it's up to us to take notice that uh, there are individuals who are fighting back. Yes, they are on the list, but they're not held by the same handling codes that we are held by. And therefore, uh, they're getting the harassment, but they're getting the harassment at the border or they're getting the harassment in the airport. While targeted individuals, we get the harassment on the street and with directed energy and a whole lot of other things. But it's all the same thing. It's all for the same reason. Uh, there is a money trail. There is a purpose why this is happening. And it's interesting how this is still a secret program with a secret list. And no one seems to answer any of the questions from the foreign nationalists to uh, U.S. citizens who are being queried, like Pastor Dosha, to targeted individuals. It seems as though no one can seem to answer any questions. And I'm making this video on behalf of targeted individuals to say enough is enough. Just like uh, pa uh, Mr. Demir is uh, filing for redress. I think it's up to targeted individuals and many others to also file for redress and file under listed individuals, uh, which is what Demir and others are filing under.